Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now rebranding and re-releasing graphics cards is by no means a new practice. A perfect example of this is the NVIDIA GTS 250, the Sparkle 512 megabyte version of which I have here. The story starts in 2007, the year Crisis would change the PC gaming world forever, and a year whereby NVIDIA released the 8800 GT. PC gamers were happy. In December of the same year, the 512 megabyte version of the 8800 GTS released. Another decent card. This is where things get a little confusing though. Nvidia then renamed the 8800 GT to the 9800 GT and overclocked the 8800 GTS, turning that into the 9800 GTX. But they weren't finished yet, oh no. If you wanted even more performance then fear not, because they later overclocked the 9800 GTX and called that the 9800 GTX Plus. Although just another card based on the G92 graphics architecture, the GTX Plus actually had a shrunken 55 nanometer die, the advantages of which meant lower power consumption, less heat and better performance. Rename it one more time and you end up with the GTS 250, a card that some argued didn't really need to exist. So why did it? Critics accused Nvidia of trying to mislead people, but they insisted it was to clear up branding and avoid any consumer confusion among the new 200 series lineup. Thus, the 250 was more recognisable as the mainstream option. After all, it cost less than the 9800 GTX Plus at $150 for the 1GB card or $130 for the 512MB option. I should probably mention the HD4850 from AMD was also already out, offering very similar performance. So were there any advantages to buying the GTS 250? Well, as I mentioned before, it ran a little cooler, cost a little less and was generally smaller in size, which doesn't sound like much, but at 9.5 inches it looked much better in a case than the bulkier GTX Plus. If you really wanted, you can even SLI the GTS 250 with the 9800 Plus, providing the memory sized matched, a cool option for enthusiasts looking to increase performance with a little less investment. Whether you think it's goodwill toward confused consumers or just a quick cash grab, I'll have to leave that up to you to decide. But now I thought we'd check out some benchmarks with comparative average results to my 9800 GTX Plus just to see if there really is any performance difference. So the first step was swapping this card into my i5-4460 and 8GB system. There will be a bottleneck but our card will be able to reach its full potential. Here is the driver version details and another look at the specs. This card, just like the 9800 GTX Plus, doesn't support DX11, so we kick things off with Left 4 Dead 2. The first thing you'll notice is that we've got more artifacts than the National History Museum. Artifacts in this case are those black flickers all over the screen, which you'll notice throughout, and are usually a result of, say, overclocking a card too far, or perhaps overheating. None of which are the case here, though. I did find some old Newegg reviews that say this version is quite troublesome though, and after trying a few different driver versions with no change, I'll have to put it down to this specific model. Left 4 Dead 2 averaged 100 FPS on the two levels we played, Docks and Dark Carnival, which we also played with the 9800 Plus and saw a small decrease to 91, with the high settings and AA off. Call of Duty World at War next with the extra settings. Playing through the first level saw an average of 65 frames per second with the GTS 250 and a very similar 63 with the 9800. I'm not sure if the difference is enough to warrant Nvidia re-releasing the card at this point, but it seems there is a slight difference from what we've seen so far. Having said that though, Crisis actually performed better on the older card. While we saw 55 FPS with the GTS 250, the 9800 averaged 60, albeit while making a little more noise and getting a little hotter, but even so, more FPS is more FPS. This is the Nomad level of the game, although I played through the Prologue Mission 2, which yielded similar results with the 9800 coming out on top. GTA 5, unlike other games, couldn't quite run at 1080p, and so dropping things to 720 was definitely the best way forward. Again, this is a little more CPU intensive, but it means that you've got a better chance of being able to run it with older cards, and with 53 FPS here, it certainly ran nicely. The 9800 Plus hit 48. Finally, it's Fallout 3. Medium settings proved rewarding with both cards, 
with the GTX Plus actually coming out on top with 62 frames to 58. Not significant and it really depends on the games you play as to which card is better. If I'm honest I'd still choose the 9800 because to me it's more iconic although it did run 11 degrees hotter on average than the 250. I would have concluded by saying that the GTS 250 existed because it offered decent performance at the $130 and $150 price points but it turns out that not long after AMD lowered the price of their newly released 4870 to match perhaps dooming the GTS 250 a little bit. So did they need to rebrand and re-release the card? Well, if I'm honest, it still offered decent enough performance at the time, but the architecture was certainly showing signs of age, and I think the PC gaming world was ready to leave G92 behind. Guys, that's the story of the GTS 250 from NVIDIA, and I hope you've enjoyed it. If you did, leave a like down below, leave a dislike if you didn't. Let me know what you think of this card, as well as whether or not you've ever owned one, or the 9800 of course. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and hopefully I'll see you all in the next one.